Hello, Rune Scholar, wherever and whenever you are. I'm the Modern Era Lark. Today, we'll be talking about the oldest phase of runic development between 150 and 500 of the Common Era. So when I say Common Era or CE, um, that is the archeological term for what you might call AD. We'll be talking today about the Elder Futhark. The Elder Futhark was used by rune writers to record texts in a language referred to by some scholars as Proto-Scandinavian, others as West Germanic or North Germanic, and still others as Ingveonic. Proto-Scandinavian is a predecessor language to Old Norse, so these runes were used to write a language that is older than Old Norse, and which eventually developed into Old Norse. If you're interested in runes for writing Old Norse, or for Viking contexts, I'll cover those in episode 7 on Younger Futharks, and on episodes later than that for its variants for specific geographic locations, so stay tuned. I mentioned in episode 2 that virtually all runic inscriptions predating 400 of the Common Era are Scandinavian, but inscriptions from this oldest phase of runic writing have been found in Russia, Ukraine, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Hungary, Romania, Poland, Sweden, Switzerland, the Czech Republic, Denmark, France, Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Norway. The characters of the Elder Futhark show remarkable uniformity between 250 and 450 and over a large geographic area spanning areas of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and parts of the Northern European continent. This uniformity includes the number of characters, the order in which they appear, and the forms the runes themselves take. It is especially surprising, considering that we have no evidence for any institution within Germanic society sufficiently powerful to create any standards regarding runic usage. Perhaps the best explanation is that the oldest runes were used by a small and specific social group for a particular purpose, such as the communication security theory that I discussed in episode three. It's still just a theory, but the majority of the population would then have remained relatively illiterate. The first surviving inscription containing the entire Futhark that we currently know about dates to around 400 of the Common Era, the Hjulfrstone from Gotland. The final symbol shown here is a type of bind rune and looks like a tiwaz and an ansus repeated to resemble a tree with six branches to the left and eight to the right. Some of the runes shown on the stone are backwards, or upside down, or skewed, or only partially complete. But this is recognizably what we would call the Elder Futhark. There are 24 unique runes in this series, from which all subsequent Germanic rune rows developed. In addition to the Schilver stone, we understand full or partial Elder Futhark rune row sequences from a pillar in Breza in Bosnia, Bracteates from Gurimpan and Waldstena, Sweden, and Mot Motala, Lindjer, Gudme, and Overhörnweik in Denmark. About 500 runic inscriptions total use this Elder Futhark. The oldest datable runic find is the Vimos comb, found in a bog and dating to 150 to 180 of the Common Era. The inscription reads Harya, meaning warrior or hairier, kind of like the jet, or perhaps something to do with hair itself, which would make sense given it's a comb. 
Similarly, the oldest runestone as of 2022 comes from Svingerud in Norway, dating from between 1 and 250 of the Common Era. The bone fragments from the same grave have been dated to between 25 and 120 CE, which is a narrower window. The inscription is probably a name, Idibeirig. Both are typical finds in that the majority of texts were added to pre-existing portable objects like garment fasteners or weapons or carved on stones. The inscriptions are short and simple. They deal with identity, ownership, weapon names, or scholars simply can't discern their meaning yet. And because many early inscriptions are unintelligible, some assume that they have a magico-religious purpose, but these might simply have an individual or private meaning that we haven't been able to unlock yet. For example, we know at least three reasonable examples of an ideographic rune, or begriffsrune, to use the German term, where the rune represents its name as a word unto itself. An inscription on an amulet from Sigtuna has three E's runes, and then immediately goes on to say these E's will, as a symbol that creates an action. Then Ester Jutland 43 contains an Elder Futhark Dagas rune, either indicating the name Dagar or the word day. And then a single Yera rune represents its name Yera, on the Stentoften runestone, dating perhaps to the 7th century. It reads, With nine steeds, with nine goat bucks, Hathuwulf gave good yera, or a good year, with the yera rune emphasized by the carver, who, interestingly, depicted it in a deliberately archaic style. We don't know how common this technique may have been among other inscriptions that we haven't yet deciphered, but we do know from the use of this technique and from younger rune poems that each rune had its own name, which was an intelligible word in the language of the time of use. These names did change over time to suit the languages that used Futhark as those languages shifted and changed. So now that I've used some of the names of the runes here, as well as in some previous episodes, let's go over what some of those runes are in Elder Futhark. The names I'm going to give you here are reconstructed Proto-Scandinavian forms based on the best interpretations of evidence that we have as of 2023, including what survives in later literature. We know what the Goths called their letters in their own system of writing, thanks to the writer Alcuin, which we learned in episode two, uh, was compiled by Bishop Wulfila. Anglo-Saxon monks wrote down lists of the names of runes as well. We also have the rune poems I mentioned earlier, like the Abecedarium Nordmanicum, the Old English rune poem, the Norwegian rune poem, and the Icelandic rune poem, most of which survive as late medieval or early modern copies, and none of which is younger than the 9th century. These rune poems preserve the names of the younger Futhark and the Anglo-Saxon Futhark, and these allow us to extrapolate a likely name for the runes of Elder Futhark. They also give us a very complete version and I'll also loop in some alternate forms from other complete Futharks, for example, the Valdstena and Grumpen Bractids. So let's begin. Fehu, the F sound, was probably the word for cattle or wealth in Proto-Scandinavian and possibly named after Audhumbla, the cow at the beginning of creation. You can also draw it as this form or this form and this one, with the direction of the arms pointing in the direction of writing. So this last one is sinistrograde, or when you're writing from right to left instead of from left to right. Uh, I'll link to the runic fonts I'm using here down in the show notes, so that if you want to do the same kind of thing, you'll have access to the same thing I do. 
Urus, the U and the long U, is a reconstructed word for aurochs, the wild ancestor of modern domestic cattle, and it may metaphorically mean vigor. Alternate readings are storm or metal slag. This form appears almost exclusively in Scandinavia and the Gothic runes, and allographs include this, this, and this one, and after Common Era 400, it almost always looks like this one. This one last, the last one here. The Schulver runestone shows this rune multiple times, and it looks slightly different each time. A Torisaz was a large, unpleasant being that we usually translate as giant in the sagas, but nature spirit may be closer to its original concept. And this is the TH sound th. It's easy to mistake for Wunyo if the rune writer wasn't tidy. And we also see uh, rounded versions in either direction or this uh, mirror version here as well. Ansu's, the short A or A, is a powerful supernatural being, probably referring to Woden, and you can also use it for the O vowel, and it also appears in these other two forms. Raido is riding, or the road on which you ride, or a journey. This R sound rolled. Linguists would call it trilled when you're speaking Germanic. You can hear that trilled R when I say Harja, Harja. A lot of variation appears for this particular rune. Some of them are rounded, some of them are angular, and this one looks almost like an Urus. Kaunas or Kenas, the K, has an unclear meaning as a word and unfortunately is a reconstructed Proto-Scandinavian word. The Scandinavian sources use kaun, which means ulcer, while Old English uses ken, meaning torch, which may be more likely, but the Gothic name for this letter is kuzma, implying a bubo, like you see for bubonic plague. Most modern rune books use torch, but there's a good linguistic case for either interpretation. The early versions of this rune are not full height, so this is a half height rune, and they point in varying directions. Gebo, the G, is gift, both the giving and the object itself that cemented reciprocal bonds in Germanic society. The only variations in this rune are in the height of the saltier, so it could be half or full height. Phonetically, this was a voiced velar fricative, which doesn't exist in modern English, and it's sort of like the H in hue, but more like a modern Greek yama, or like the G in the Spanish word amigo. Unio is the W sound. Its meaning is complex, incorporating freedom from want, the protection of loved ones, and friendship. Allographs include this rounded version, which dominates in Scandinavia, and this angular mirrored version, which is more common in the Frisian areas. With Hagalaz, we begin what's called the winter runes. Hagalaz has multiple potential sound values, both H and the CH in Loch, and it means the winter precipitation hail, though rune poems in Norse, Icelandic, and English also call it a kind of grain, which I suppose if you think of individual pellets of hail, like graupel, makes sense. It contrasts with the warmth of Wunyo and probably tells us that joy is finite. This original single bard version shows up more frequently in Scandinavian and Gothic texts. Other forms include this double barred version, which occurs more frequently in Frisian, English, and Continental Germanic after about 650, but has not yet been seen in Scandinavian so far. And another form with the middle stroke upward and to the right, but my runic fonts didn't have a version of that. Now these, 
is the N sound, and it is the opposite of wunyo. It is need, compulsion, imprisonment, distress, or the destructiveness of a winter storm. It may also be written with the crossbar going the other direction, and it doesn't necessarily correlate to the direction of the writing. On the Frank's casket, the whole letter appears sloped at about 30 degrees, probably to save space. Isas, or Isan, is the last of the winter runes. It means ice, freezing, binding, and stasis. Ice coexisted with the primeval cow Audhumbla at the beginning of creation, and through the application of fire, everything in creation formed from this ice. It sounds like E and I, and only varies in height, and it never shows up in any more complex form than a single stroke. Yera, Y, means year, a measure of time, but also the growing season specifically, and was associated with harvest and fertility. You can write this rune many ways. You can rotate it 90 degrees, and um, you can also write it with rounded corners, and it's easy to mistake for an inguz if you're not careful. It's pretty consistently half height until about 500 CE when we start seeing full height forms that look like this, or tilted almost like a hurricane symbol. It then develops into staved forms, like this, and we no longer see the smaller versions of this rune after that development. This uh, second form here eventually evolves into a vowel, so stay tuned for the episode on Younger Futhark. In the 6th and 7th century, sometimes we see this rune simplified into this rune. Yeah, I, I, I know this one is hard, and it's almost like yours are all different. So if that wasn't enough of a mess, I was or a has is a difficult rune, not to be confused with a was. I was is the name of this rune. Because it occurs very rarely in Elder Futhark inscriptions, scholars agree neither on the meaning nor the precise sound of the letter, although some consensus has formed around a meaning associated with the yew tree. Elmer Antonsen suggested that it sounded like the short A in cat, while Leo Connolly suggested an E value. Tinica Luyenga pointed out that this rune may have been a bind rune of Yera and Isas with a Yi or an E value. Of the few examples, many occur in inscriptions that don't give us much vocal context. Its rarity may indicate a Proto-Scandinavian vowel or other intervocalic sound a transition between vowels that was becoming lost to the language already by the time that the Futharks were being written, and it will occur in both directions. Perth, or perhaps Pertho or Perthro, in this particular form is found in only three Elder Futhark inscriptions, the Hoganvik stone, the Silver stone, and the inscription on the Grimpan bracket. This is quite possibly because the voiceless plosive p, p sound that it makes very rarely occurred in the Proto-Germanic languages, usually in loanwords from other languages. The meaning of its name is game or play, but with a connotation of equivocal results akin to hazard or gamble. This one on the left is its least uncommon form, with occasional usage of an upside down awas, uh, a reversed rounded berkano, uh, like this rune here on the Vodstana Bractit, uh, this last version on the Breza Futhark, and um, You'll see some other runes from later developments that will look like this last one. Algis. We figure that it sounded like Z or the palatal R, Z, which 
changed in sound by the time both Old English and Old Norse developed from Proto-Germanic. This letter never begins a word. It only appears in the middle or the end of the word. And it evolved into that final R that you see written capitalized at the end of words by the Viking Age. And for example, the reconstructed Gothic word fiskals evolved into Old Norse fisker, and that sound becomes deleted in Old English fisk. The original meaning in the Old English rune poem of Algis is unclear. Um, some kind of a plant or a large animal that will wound those that get close. Uh, elk is a particularly attractive interpretation, but in Norse it may have meant bow, uh, like, like the weapon. Not many allographs occur, but um, this uh, upside down form and a combined form both do appear. So willow is the S sound, and it means sun. It shows up in a whole bunch of different forms, all formed from a series of zigzags, usually with three or four, but sometimes with extra strokes. If it looks like zigzags, that's probably a solo. So I won't even try to show some allographs here, but it's usually three or four strokes. Tiwaz was probably the name of a very prominent Germanic deity that was popular before Wodanaz rose to preeminence. Probably a war god from the spear-like shape of this rune, uh, and it makes a T sound. This is nearly always its shape here, uh, but we do see a few examples where the strokes hit uh, partway up the stave and this reversed version here. Berkana makes the B sound, or a less closed voiced labial velar approximant that's somewhere between a B and a W, kind of like if you blow out a candle but you don't round your lips. Ugh. The name means birch, but it has metaphorical meanings of springtime and youth. The form usually has a stave and two chevrons, but it also has a rounded form and um, this spaced version is uh, more common on the continent in Frisia and in Anglo-Saxon. The Svingered stone variation had four pockets and that form appeared twice on that stone, so it seems to be a deliberate choice by the rune writer. A was, which I mentioned earlier in, context, uh, uh, in, in contrast to I was, A was is usually eh, and sometimes e, and it may have overtaken i was in this latter sound. Its other form, the simplified version, uh, shows up mainly in earlier Danish inscriptions on metal objects. So this may be its original form, or maybe it was just preferred by metal workers. That part is unclear. The name means horse, and you can kind of see that from its shape. Manas means man or human, and may reference the divine ancestor Manus that Tacitus described in his writing about the northern Germanic tribes. It sounds like M, and it's pretty consistent until younger Futhark evolved. Lagus, L, is water, and time also flowed in Germanic culture. The Old English Rune poem calls it lagu or ocean, and both the Old Icelandic and the Norse rune poem refer to water to name this rune. Wolfgang Kausa thought that the name should be laukas, the leek vegetable, because this rune was sometimes used ideographically to abbreviate the full word and bless the inscription with fertility, a usage implicated in the phrase alu laukas. You usually write this rune with the branch pointing in the direction of the text, so uh, this variant here uh, is what you see whenever it's sinistrograde, or written from right to left. 
This rune is half height in Elder Futhark, uh, but we probably see it rotated 45 degrees into a square on the Shilver Stone and on the Koval Spearhead. It makes the Velar nasal ing sound, and its name Ingwaz or Inguz is the name of the divine hero who became Frey the consort of the mother goddess, and the Old English rune poem explicitly calls out the wagon of Nertus, the earth mother. His name may have survived in the tribal name of the Ingveones and the Inglinga dynasty. Dagas, which can be either D or F, that the sound, uh, means day or daylight. It's usually written half height in its early form, but it does show up full height and rounded, like this version, and some Bracteates use uh, this, which you probably saw earlier. Odela, uh, or Odala, and Dagas are sometimes switched as the last rune in Elder Futhark, depending upon the inscription. Uh, Odela means homeland, estate, or inherited wealth. Proto-Germanic hadn't yet involved a short O, so this is always a long O. You can round it into a ribbon or rotate it like on the Ilerup spearhead. And from this early period, later runic traditions begin to differ by region. We'll discuss those in our next episode. Thank you for reading the runes with me. The Modern Era Lab.